Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning he arrived again in the temple area, and the people started coming to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you have to say? They said this to test him, so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, Let the one among you who was without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin any more. The Gospel of the Lord. I have come to rate all as loss in the light of the surpassing knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ. For his sake, I have forfeited everything. Have you met the Lord yet? Because it is possible, my brothers and sisters, come to church every Sunday, receive all of your sacraments, and still never encounter Christ. Personal conversion, that is at the heart of our faith. Contrary to popular belief, conversion is not a one-time thing. To encounter Christ, we must be in a constant state of conversion. A living relationship with the Lord is always developing, always changing. And we can see this very clearly in the life of St. Paul. He begins his life as a Pharisee and a persecutor of the early church. He antagonizes the martyrdom of St. Stephen. And then he encounters the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. And he is changed forever. The strong man is made weak. The man who was so knowledgeable about the ways of God realizes he knows nothing at all and has to learn all over again. The man who thought he had everything realizes he had nothing. I have come to rate all as loss in the light of the surpassing knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ. For his sake, I forfeit everything. That's what conversion does. It changes our whole value system. Things that seemed so important to us before, money, status, pleasure, suddenly seem trivial or even unappealing. Encountering the Lord changes us. In our gospel, do you think this woman was changed by her encounter with Christ? If you believe, as the fathers of the church did, that this woman was Mary Magdalene, she most certainly was changed. But notice, when Jesus showed her mercy, he didn't give her a free ride. He tells her, go and sin no more. Change. And that's the two things we need for conversion. First, a willingness to change. A willingness to stop trying to justify our sins and instead let them go. Second, we have to be seeking the Lord in prayer. We have become such a society of instant gratification. If God doesn't answer our prayers immediately, or if I don't feel his presence constantly, we're all ready to throw in the towel. Conversion takes commitment, perseverance, patience, and time. I was not, as a young man, I was very arrogant and rude. I was not the same, I am not the same person I was in my 20s. I am not the same priest I was when I was first ordained. My outlook has changed. I'm not even the same priest I was when I became pastor here almost eight years ago. The Lord has had to knock me down plenty of times through the years and teach me many things, and I still have more to learn. And I pray that God will help me with his grace to have a better mastery of all the virtues, especially patience, humility, and temperance. But where does conversion begin? How do we condition ourselves to receive conversion? Now that's a good question. 
There is a common thread in all of our readings today. The prophet Isaiah said in our first reading, Remember not the events of the past, of things long ago consider not. See, I am doing something new. St. Paul in our second reading said today, Just one thing, forget what lies behind, rather strain forward to what lies ahead. And in the gospel, Jesus forgives the adulterous woman of her past and challenges her to change her future. Go and sin no more. We will never experience conversion stuck in the past. We will never experience conversion clinging to old mistakes we have made or clinging to past hurts others have inflicted on us. Anger, unforgiveness, and self-pity keep dragging us into the past and make us relive the past over and over and over again. And that keeps us from advancing into the future. So that's the first step toward conditioning ourselves to conversion, letting go of the past. The second is praising God in the present. Why is giving God praise so important? Praising God combats negativism, and being negative is at the core of many of our sins. Ultimately, we sin for two reasons, because we're afraid or we're unhappy. When we feel negativity, we, when we condition ourselves to see the worst in people or situations, instead of the best, that gives way to complaining, gossip, jealousy, unforgiveness, which then become the seed ground for bigger and better sins. It's a snowball effect. That's why I encouraged everybody to give up negativity for Lent this year. No complaining, no sarcasm, no dark humor. Don't even allow yourself negative thoughts. Now, everyone who has tried this has come to me and told me how hard it is. I know. I fail in some small way every single day. In other days, I fail big. But I have also noticed positive changes in myself this Lent. I find that I'm not tempted to commit other sins I normally succumb to that are seemingly unrelated to negativity, like overeating. Now, I have noticed my appetite has significantly diminished this Lent. Why is that? I suspect it's because I'm a stress eater. I eat when I'm nervous or upset. And reducing negativity has a tranquilizing effect. By the way, I had my annual physical this past week, and for the first time in years, my blood pressure was not high. That is amazing, considering this physical took place in the wake of my uncle's death, my dad's death, and in the midst of Lent, the busiest and by far the most stressful time of the year for a priest. I also noticed not succumbing to negativity was easier this time than the last time I attempted it a few years ago. That means I'm getting better at it. Another thing I do during Lent is I don't allow myself to listen to secular music. Not that I ever listen to anything bad, but during Lent I only listen to religious music. Church hymns, praise music, old gospel songs, Gregorian chant, music that praises God. And I have noticed that alone has had an effect on my disposition. I'm more patient, especially when driving. Try it! Listen to religious music while you're driving. You will find you get a lot more patient. That's the effect of praising God. That's the effect of taking joy in the Lord. Another way to combat negativity is by keeping your focus here and now. Don't worry about what's coming up later in the week. Don't overthink what's already happened in the past. Keep your focus on what needs to be done now. Nothing else. Finally, the third way we need to condition ourselves for conversion is to remind yourself of the reward that's waiting for you. Heaven. Now, as I mentioned, my dad died last week, and I really haven't mourned him. I really haven't cried for him. And some people say it's because it hasn't hit me yet. Maybe so. Maybe after Easter, when life slows down a bit, it'll hit me then. Or maybe as a priest, I'm just so used to dealing with death. I say an average of two funerals a week. Maybe death just doesn't affect me as profoundly as it does the average person. But I can't be sad for my father. He was a good man. I'm confident in his salvation. 
I know he's finally free of the physical limitations that he experienced in this last stage of his life. When I think of heaven, I think of Sunday afternoon dinner at my grandparents' house. And if you think I can tell a story, I can't hold a candle to other members in my family. My grandfather, my Uncle Louie, my Uncle John, and my cousin Louis were master storytellers. And we would sit at the table all afternoon and eat and drink and listen to endless stories and laugh till our sides split. And I miss all those people because they're all gone now. But I think that's something of what the heavenly banquet must be like, but a billion times bigger and infinitely better because Jesus is there at the table too. And I got to imagine he's got some whopper of stories to tell as well. Taking time occasionally to consider that, to think about that, to meditate on that, will keep away negativity and make you thirst for conversion like you've never thirsted for anything before. Don't ever be afraid of changing. Don't ever be afraid of getting closer to God. Let go of the past and keep pushing yourself forward by conditioning your conversion. And blessed be God forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.